The fifth and last of the techniques that we consider here is the decomposition technique. The decomposition technique has two steps. The first step is to identify a key component, and then the second step is to condition on the state of that key component. Now you can choose any component you want as the key component, but sometimes the technique is a little bit easier if you choose a component that has a particularly unique uh, position in the system, and we'll see how that works in an example going forward. Using the decomposition technique, the reliability function is written as the probability that the system functions given the key component functions times the probability that the key component functions plus the probability that the system functions given the key component fails times the probability that the key component fails. So this is just a simple application of conditional probability. Instead of writing that out in words, you can also write it out symbolically, where r of p is r of 1i p times p sub i plus r of 0i p times 1 minus p sub i, where i is the index of the key component. This r of 1i p and r of 0i p is defined in exactly the same fashion as we did for structure functions. Here's an example. Find r of p using component 2 as the key component. So here's the approach. First of all, we consider component 2 replaced by a perfect component. The way I like to think about that is I replace that component 2 by just a line. So now we have a line that looks like that. In other words, there's no sense of having to be concerned about component 2 failing. Well, when we do that, what have we done to component 1? We have made it irrelevant. The state of component 1 does not matter anymore. The only thing that matters are components 3 and 4. And if either component 3 or component 4 is functioning, then this system is functioning. And that leads you to this particular block diagram which is appropriate when component 2 is replaced by a perfect component. Now the other extreme is you say what if component 2 is replaced by a failed component? The way I like to think of that is if component 2 right here has failed then I can think of getting rid of all that. If I know it's failed it's like it's not even being there and now if you look at the remaining system you can see that it is also a parallel system. This time component 1 did not become irrelevant. Finally the last step in decomposition to get your reliability function you write down the reliability function of this particular system multiplied by P2. Remember 2 is the key component so that's why you put a P2 there and then you multiply that by the reliability of this system and then you multiply by 1 minus P2. If you'd like to uh, multiply that out it might simplify a little bit. Now here is an exercise. We want to use the decomposition technique to find the reliability function of the bridge structure. So first step is to decide which component to use as the key component. Now as, as indicated earlier, sometimes you pick a key component um, which will make your life a little bit easier by picking one that's kind of a unique component in the system and 3 is obviously that unique component. So we're going to condition on the state of component 3. So when component 3 functions. And again the way I like to think of that is just think of a line going through here. In other words component 3 is a perfect component which is to say you have a line going through there you always know that 3 will work so you can just think of that as a line passing through there. Well in that case what will the system look like? It'll look like this. 
if either one or two are working and either components four or five are working, then this particular system with component three being perfect will be the result. Now the next thing you want to ask is what does the system look like when component 3 fails? So in this particular case if component 3 is guaranteed to be failing that's like getting rid of this middle portion and all of a sudden when you look at that you can see right away what you have is you have 1 and 4 along the top. That's one path through that system. And then you have 2 and 5 along the bottom. And that's it. So there is your system in that particular case. Finally, to use the decomposition technique, we say that R of P is equal to the reliability function for our first system that we wrote down there. And that will be 1 minus 1 minus P1, 1 minus P2. And that is the reliability of that parallel system but it is in series with the parallel system consisting of 4 and 5. So that's going to be 1 minus 1 minus P4, 1 minus P5. Why do those two terms in brackets get multiplied? Because those two subsystems are in series with one another. Since component 3 is our key component, we multiply this by P3 and then we go to the second piece. Now what we want to do is we want to write down the reliability function for this system. And what does that look like? That looks like 1 minus 1 minus P1, P4 because component 1 and component 4 are in series and 1 minus P2, P5, because component 2 and component 5 are a series subsystem. So there in the brackets, that is the reliability function for our system, which applies when component 3 fails. And this gets multiplied by the probability of component 3 failings failing, which is 1 minus P3. Here are some comments on the five techniques for calculating R of P. There are other methods than these five. For example, one of them is called the delta star technique. Number two, all five of these techniques are exact. They will give you the exact system reliability if you have the correct component reliabilities and the component failures are independent. All of the techniques, but especially the path vector technique and the cut vector technique, become cumbersome as n increases. And when you have a large value of n, lots of components in the system, sometimes instead of getting an exact reliability, you can calculate something called a reliability bound, and that will be looked at in the last section of this chapter. There are some ways to overcome the um, binary assumption, and here is one relaxation. That relaxation is you have a multi-state system. So instead of only being functioning or failed, that is 0 or 1, we allow several states, maybe functioning, partially functioning, and failed. 
a second relaxation of the binary assumption is to assume continuous states and that is you might have a component or a system that's working at say 82 percent capacity. There is lots of literature out there on multi-state systems and on continuous state systems. The second thing that we have are an assumption of independent states. That can also be relaxed two different ways. One way is to assume a common operating environment that affects all of the components. And then relaxation number two is consider component lifetimes which are associated. And the word associated is slightly stronger than correlated and can apply to these lifetimes. Here are a few more comments on the five techniques that we've covered. Reliability is certainly an important factor for design engineers, but there are other factors that need to be considered. Particularly in military applications, cost, schedule, and performance come up quite commonly. After the uh, failed helicopter attempt of the hostages in 1980, the military set up something called R&M 2000, which was reliability and maintainability in the year 2000. And what they wanted to do basically is double, time, double the time to failure and have the time to maintain. So in R&M 2000, they took these three criteria and said that you have to add reliability and maintainability and put it at an equal footing in terms of the, uh, consider the factors to consider when putting together a uh, weapon system for purchase by the uh, Department of Defense. Now another thing that comes in in the commercial setting is you want to consider marketability and that's got to be a factor as well because you do want to sell your item even if it's uh, great price, schedule, performance, maintainability, you also want to have it marketable. There is a result that is of interest to design engineers and it goes like this. For independent and identical comp components in a coherent system with no minimal path sets and minimal cut sets of cardinality 1, the reliability function R of P is an S-shaped function of P. Now that is to say if we have a graph and we have P on the horizontal axis and we have R of P on the vertical axis, of course both of those go from 0 to 1. What is meant by S-shaped here is that this function will look something like that. Now one thing that's nice about knowing that is if you're at this point right here in terms of your component reliability you do not have a great system reliability but if you can move just a little bit to the uh, right if you're near this bend right here you can see you go up quite a bit in terms of the system reliability. Finally the last step here or the last bullet is the reliability port importance is a generalization of the structural importance and this helps design engineers determine where to put their effort to improve the reliability of a system and we will start in on reliability importance on the next slide.